Hello, faithful friends of the internet. I'm Jason Mayfield, and I've never been a reader. But in the fourth quarter of 2019, it seems like I have finally locked down a pretty significant reading habit. I've completed 13 books cover to cover, which isn't as impressive as some people. And well, it's just kind of because you're, you're kind of stupid, Jason. He is the worst. But it's 13 more than I read in 2018. Oh, that's sad. Now, I do want to make a quick note. You're not going to hear a lot about devotional material and theological material. Why? Because I do not read devotionals hardly ever. It is so rare that I read one. And then I don't really read theolo the blah, 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 blah. I don't really read theological material front to back. Typically, whenever I'm reading theological material, it is something that I'm reading on a case-by-case -case basis, something that I need, something that I'm asked questions on. My theological and devotional stuff pretty much happens in the Word. I like to interface with the Bible, which is primarily what we deal with on this channel. So here are the 13 books that I read in the fourth quarter of 2019. That's October, November, and December for those of you who are challenged. Links to all of these books are in the description. First, we've got Atomic Habits by James Clear. Now, let me just tell you this. The, the list I'm giving you is not in any particular order or any particular ranking. However, this book is the number one book on all levels. It's the first in the list. It's the first one you should buy. It's the first one you should read. And it this is a game changing book. This book would couple really well with The Compound Effect by Darren Hardy. I actually just talked about both of those books in my 2020 Bible reading plan video, but these these two books would couple really well. The Compound Effect is about the uh, gradual compounding of small actions in your life. This book talks about the aggregation of marginal gains. Phenomenal book. You need to get this one. If I can give you the big idea, it's that your habits, whether that's developing good habits or breaking bad habits, but your habit development and your habit breaking are probably systematic issues that need a systematic solution, not so much about your desire or your willpower or your motivation. You could probably apply this book to every area of your life. The second book is The Alter Ego Effect. Todd Herman or Todd Herman, I'm not really sure how to pronounce his last name. It's probably Todd Herman because that's the one I don't want to say all the time. Anyway, old Todd here, he deals and works with a lot of professional athletes, a lot of high performance folks. And essentially, if I was to summarize the idea of the book, it's he is helping people shift between the different gears that they have in their life. So you can step into different situations in your life that uh, demand a different type of performance activity, outlook, mindset, whatever that might be, but different places in your life that you can step in and shift gears so you can, you know, be a high performer. And the best, you know, I, I guess if you were to just break it down, think of uh, like the difference between when you're at home and when you're at work. It's not that you're two different people, but there's definitely two different demands and two different mindsets that you have to step into if you want to be a high performer at home with your family and a high performer at work and whatever your career is. Excellent book, The Alter Ego Effect. The 12 Week Year. I actually did not like this book very much at all. Uh, I don't even know that I'd recommend you reading it, but I did read it. What's funny is it's the 12 week year. It was actually the 13th book that I read, and it's the one I, only one I didn't like. So it was unlucky number 13. This book is more of a framework on how to be a high producer, how to accomplish the most possible in a 12 week period. And the idea is that a lot of times we make goals that are, you know, a year long and we try to do something like you're, you're going into 2020 saying, well, I'm doing this in 2020. And he's saying, rather than look at the year as a year, look at 12 weeks as a year. And so that's the idea of the book. There was one good takeaway in here, and the good takeaway to me was uh, how he talks about accountability and some of the issues that we have when we're dealing with accountability, especially as leaders, and how it ends up stifling our teams and stifling our employees and stifling the stifled. 
Perfect and Forgiven by Zach Maldonado. This is a really great little book. You can read it quick. It's not a long read. One of the things I love about Zach is that, well, one of the things I love is that we share a lot of the same theology. We're both grace guys. But uh, Zach doesn't pull any punches and he doesn't skirt around what he's trying to say. When you the, really on the first page of this book, you're getting a very clear picture of what he's trying to communicate. He doesn't come in with these long exhaustive stories and then make a little point and then move on to another long exhaustive story. It is just uh, direct statement after direct statement after direct statement. I really believe this book not only is a good, simple, easy read, I also think it's going to encourage you, but it's also going to help you with some of the theology that you may need to get shaped up around grace. So I would really encourage you to read this book. Designing Your Life. This is written by Bill Burnett and Dave Evans. Both of these guys work at Stanford and they are instructors in the design department. They deal with different types of design, but if you're wondering what I mean by design. I'm not talking about graphic design. Think more like architecture and engineering. But they work at Stanford and essentially what happened was they're working at one of the best schools in the world and they're watching students graduate and be unable to get jobs. They are unable to make enough money and most of them that are getting jobs and are making money are miserable in the job that directly correlates with what their degree was in. So these guys developed a class to help people succeed succeed before they go off and get all of this education to succeed not only in what they want to do and what they will do, but in their planning of what they're going to do. So this is a really cool book. And I'll tell you who I think this would be great for. If you are a pastor of connection or assimilation or discipleship, I really think you ought to read this book. You know, when I look at things that are really big in church assimilation now, like the growth track and the class 101, 201, 301, 401, and next steps courses, and all of that kind of stuff. When I look at those, one of the major issues I see is we're not helping people discover their life purpose. A lot of times we talk about people being called and having a purpose and what that ends up is we end up just kind of signing them up to work on the uh, parking lot team for church services. And obviously God has designed more into people than that. I think this book gives a great framework and at least gives some great perspective that especially those of you in those type of ministries could take this, put it into your courses, put it into your classes that you're teaching. It could really, really help you. So I would highly recommend this book. How Rich People Think. This is a short book. This is actually a series. I think it's Ignite Reads, Spark, Impact, in just one hour. It's a very cool little book. Uh, I probably read this over two days because I try not to you know, sit down and read a ton, but you could read this in one day. Uh, Anything that gets you to think like someone who has money, I really recommend you having because most of what's keeping you broke is not having the mindset for money and not having a mindset for wealth. I thought this was really good. It helped me to straighten out some thoughts that I have. And uh, because even when you do have the good thoughts, you can kind of slip back into those old patterns. I would recommend this. It's an easy read and it also can etch up your numbers uh, because you want to throw in a couple of simple books in there. And this is a simple one. The Little Book of Common Sense Investing. There's a hair in there. I actually wasn't planning on reading this book until the end of 2020, but when I read How Rich People Think, I thought, I bet a rich person would read a book on money right now. <laughs> and so I grabbed one of my books on money. Other than Atomic Habits, this is the only book I read that took, just made immediate impact on my behavior and my actions and my life. And after reading this book, I invested about 15,000 additional dollars. So I would really encourage you to read this. I thought it, get, it it really helps. It's not This is not high-level money stuff. And the high-level money stuff that's in here doesn't bog you down. But it's, this is really simple, basic behavioral stuff in terms of how to take your money as an average individual and build wealth through investing. So check this book out. The Four Agreements. Now, to be totally honest, 
I didn't know what I was getting into when I got this book. It was recommended to me. I think I heard it through like a podcast or something. And I thought, let me read that. The only reason I read it cover to cover is I'm trying to be committed in this season, which has worked for me, by the way, but I'm trying to be committed to reading books that I start or finishing books that I start. That's something I picked up that I heard Bill Gates say in an interview, or maybe it was that thing he did on Netflix. Where was it? I don't know. This book is an absolute theological disaster. I don't want to mince words here. It is a theological nightmare. As a matter of fact, if you read this book, I would encourage you to get a Sharpie and on the cover of it, write Jesus is Lord. This is the only book that I read that I actually scribbled things out. Scribbles. However, the four main principles of the book, not bad. Those four principles are be impeccable with your word. Don't take anything personally. Don't make assumptions and always do your best. Four things that really are great guideposts for life. However, everything that surrounds it was a little, well, it was a lot off base. So if you read it, you kind of have to go, this guy's not a theologian, but he may have a couple of good life principles. So I'm on this one. The Magnolia Story by Chip and Joanna Gaines. I read somewhere at some time that billionaires tend to read biographies. And so I decided I really wanted to have some biographies and autobiographies as part of my library. This is one of those. This was a really inspiring story. You know, right now in our culture, we see Chip and Joanna Gaines everywhere. There's reruns of Fixer Upper on every 15 minutes on HGTV. They're in Target. They've got stuff everywhere. And it's really phenomenal how much they've succeeded. But this book talks about the process of getting there. And so one of the really inspiring concepts from this book for me was just keep doing the right things. And to borrow from a quote in Atomic Habits, you should be far more concerned with your current trajectory than your current results. I really enjoyed this. I would encourage you to read it as well. This was also written kind of in an interesting style because Joanna Gaines writes it from, and like she's like the main kind of font in here. And then they had a different font that was Chip. And so anytime that Chip would write or interject, he was a different font. So it's really neat. It's kind of like a conversation, like you're sitting down with them and they're just telling you their life story. It was really cool. The Ride of a Lifetime by Robert Iger. Yes, the CEO of Disney, Bob Iger. This book I enjoyed more than any book I read this quarter uh, in terms of my nonfiction reading, which I'll get to in a minute. But this uh, is just phenomenal. Bob Iger kind of wraps up this. It's like an autobiography with leadership principles. It, it was really fascinating. Now, I probably have a small bias because I've always been super fascinated with broadcast media and his time at ABC. Just really interesting. But I think if you remove that bias, this is still a fantastic book. I mean, this is dealing with Disney and ABC and ESPN. So somebody like something in there somewhere. Really, really cool book. So that brings us up to 10 books, but let me interject something before we go on to the last three. I've never been a fiction reader. I think it's a waste of time and energy. Well, in November, I really started to cook with my reading, and I started to think if I was to start reading some fiction, it would help me cut back on my TV time or my YouTube consumption and would allow me to check off a few more books. And you need to understand, for me, books are not just something that you read. Every book that I read is an accomplishment, and every book that I finish is a trophy. Not to mention, I read an article online about reading faster because I figured if I can read faster, I could read more. Well, I was surprised when I read the article and it said the best way to read faster is to read more. So if you read more, you read faster and you can read more and you read faster. It's a cycle. So I decided to jump off into some fiction reading, and I kind of had three criteria when I was picking out a fiction book. One of them is that I wanted it to be a book series, so if I enjoyed it, I could keep going with it. The second is that I wanted it to be something I was relatively unfamiliar with. That way, you know, 
when I read it and then I want to go watch a movie, I would know whether or not the book was really better than the movie or if people were just being pompous holes whenever they said that. And the third thing is I wanted it to be a lower reading level, like sixth to seventh grade. I did not want to have to work when I was reading it. I wanted it to be an easy, fun read. So I decided to go with Harry Potter. Hmm. A little light demonic reading. Get out of my video, Joshua Verwers. So this was really good for me because I'm not familiar with the franchise. I've never seen the movies. And actually what I've been doing is when I read one of the books, when I'm done, I watch one of the movies and guess what? The books really are better. So last quarter, I finished the first three books. I am halfway through the fourth book, but you don't get credit for unfinished books. So that's everything that I read in the fourth quarter of 2019. I have links to each one of those books in the description below. You can also leave a comment on the books that you've read in the last quarter, and you can leave a comment with the books that you're wanting to read in 2020. And I'll see you in the next one.